All right, um, if you disagree with the title of this video and just came here to downvote and leave an unfriendly comment, um, go ahead, I love free speech. Also like and subscribe and perhaps maybe support me on Patreon. But I just want you to know I'm not here to call anyone racist or to tell you that if you're poor it's just because you're dumb and you deserve it. That's, that's not really my style because for most of the world, wage suppression is a huge problem and has been for a very long time. And while I disagree that this is in any way the fault of immigrants, I'm gonna do my best to steel man your argument before I offer any alternative. So first, when we're talking about wage suppression, I'm gonna go through a very dorky and probably unnecessary explanation on the difference between real wages and nominal wages. Nominal wages refer to the absolute amount a worker is paid, whereas real wages refer to that same amount adjusted for the cost of goods and services. So if you earn £10 an hour and your wage is increased to £10.20, this would be a nominal wage increase of 2%. But if the rate of inflation over this period was 3%, your purchasing power has dropped and the real wage has fallen. This is wage suppression. And if you've worked for a wage at any point in the last 45 years, this has probably happened to you. To give you an example, here are a couple of graphs showing how real wages in the US have either been stagnant or declining since the 1970s. For most of the world, this trend has been the norm. So what does this have to do with immigration? The idea is fairly simple. The price of labor, like anything else, is affected by supply and demand. If you do something to drastically increase the supply of labor, say by increasing immigration, but the demand for labor doesn't keep up, the price of labor, i.e. the wage, will fall. The consequence of immigration, we're told, is that local workers become forced to accept lower wages in order to compete with migrant workers. You can find this argument all over the internet, from the centre-right all the way over to Nazbol types on the fringe. And if I wanted to, I could just respond to some clips from Spudgun of Blockhead over here and that would be fun. But the interesting thing about the idea of immigration and wage suppression is, it doesn't come from these people. It comes from the left. In 1845, Friedrich Engels wrote about the influx of Irish immigrants to the UK during the Industrial Revolution. Most of them were there because of the potato famine, and their vulnerable position was exploited by bosses eager to take advantage of the cheap labour. He referred to them as the Industrial Reserve Army of Labour, a mass of people unemployed, often on the brink of starvation, desperate enough to sell themselves short in an increasingly competitive job market. Karl Marx took the idea one step further and said the reserve army was necessary for capitalism to survive. In an essay on wages, he says, the main purpose of the bourgeois in relation to the worker is to have the commodity labor as cheaply as possible, which is only possible when the supply of this commodity is as large as possible in relation to the demand for it, i.e. when overpopulation is the greatest. Overpopulation is therefore in the interest of the bourgeoisie. This might be why, despite being in what many are calling a migrant crisis, the consensus amongst economists is that Europe is currently underpopulated. And it has been for some time now. But are they really doing this because they want to suppress wages? Well, the data suggests otherwise. Over the past decade, research has shown that the negative impact of immigration on real wages has been negligible at most. A study from the Bank of England found that most of those impacted by immigration were semi-skilled and unskilled workers in the services sector. They estimated that a 10% increase in the proportion of migrants working in this sector would correlate with a 1.88% reduction of pay. The results of similar studies in the United States and France have been about the same. In the US, it was actually shown that immigration increased wages for every section of the workforce with at least a high school degree. High school dropouts experienced a 1.1% decrease in their real wage in the long term. And none of this is to mention the benefits of immigration through other things like taxes, of which they always pay more than they receive, whilst also using public services at a lower rate than natives. But this is not the argument I want to make, because I know that most people who make the wage suppression argument are already aware of this. And I know that for them, any amount of wage suppression caused by immigration is too much. And if that's where the bar is, what I've done is prove that immigration does cause wage suppression. You could even throw them a bone and say that these studies are limited to legal immigration, whereas the effect of undocumented workers on real wages is a little harder to measure. 
And I personally wouldn't be a very good socialist if I just shrugged off a wage cut, however small, for people who make barely any money as it is. I'm not saying the net benefits of immigration shouldn't be emphasized. They should be. But there is a problem with treating this as the thing that ends the argument. A problem which I think is perfectly illustrated in this rather uncomfortable scene from the film Brexit the Uncivil War. The, the, the hard facts, right? The Treasury receives a net benefit of £20 billion a year from EU workers Decision. paying into the system, growing the economy. That's after using public services. So they are paying for, for more care, more teachers, more... That's not a good thing. Yes, no one's saying that's not... To be a member of the single largest trading bloc in the entire world. But what benefit am I seeing from that where I'm from? Ah, oh, you do realise. This is, uh, yeah, bad. But people making these promises, people that you have never heard of, hmm? the risk to you and your children. There's no risk. Come to where I'm from. There's nothing to lose. Because you are nervous about people with a different colour skin and a different oh, accent. Thank you yes. very much. Sick of being called that. What did I call you? What did I you say? You know what you were calling me. No, I you don't know, know what you were calling no, me. I don't. Racist. 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 When That's did I what? say you? You can sit there all your light and say, I've had my life coming from your big city. The past few years have been fucking awful. That's right, so let's make it. If you must know that, that will solve the And all trouble. I hear all the time is shut up. Shut up, shut up. Don't talk about it. Don't mention it ever. Well, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of feeling like nothing. Like I have nothing. Like I know nothing. Like I am nothing. I'm sick of it. <laughs> <laughs> So, a focus group participant is flummoxed by a tirade of facts from the Conservative Communications Director, and the conversation ends with her breaking down, most likely being lodged further into the anti-immigrant wing than she ever had been. Anyone who was around for the Brexit referendum in 2016 knows just how real conversations like this are. So, what went wrong here? Was it that this woman was ignorant? Maybe. Was she being racist? Well, maybe. There is an earlier scene in the film where she talks about terrorism whilst gesturing at the young brown girl in the room, but for the purposes of this video we'll just pretend that didn't happen. Because I would rather be charitable and suggest that her reluctance to accept the benefits of immigration is more rooted in the fact that this might be the only explanation she has ever been given for her suffering. And by suffering, I mean this. Between 2007 and the Brexit referendum of 2016, British workers experienced a real wage contraction of around 10%, the largest in Europe, save only for Greece. The rate of child poverty in the UK is now almost a third. For the protagonist here, the experience of getting bulldozed by an establishment technocrat is just one more building block of humiliation that does nothing to address the conditions that drew her to the anti-migrant position in the first place. Her issue isn't just that she's misinformed, it's that she's part of a broken working class that has been politically abandoned by centre-left and right-wing parties alike. The new Labour project of Tony Blair and the subsequent distancing of mainstream parties from working class politics effectively kicked entire communities out of political discourse and ignored them. With no one there to speak on their behalf, this left them open for racist politicians to show up at their doors and say things like, we know you're suffering and it's because of all these immigrants. Correcting disinformation like this matters, of course, but it's useless if it fails to answer the concerns that make disinformation like this so attractive in the first place. And this is exactly the mistake made by our technocratic friend here. It's a perfect example of someone winning the debate, but losing the argument. Because all she hears is, everything's fine, and is given no resolve to that deep and visceral feeling of worthlessness so often felt by working class people. The final cadence of her outburst is not a plague upon foreigners, it's the words, I am nothing. The internet has no shortage of memes and clips of racist goons getting owned on immigration, and though this is very entertaining, I often feel that what we're looking at here is more than just stupidity or hatred. It's the result of a population going through decades of economic decline, of a failed education system, of a group with no political voice in a landscape that inevitably leaves them open to scapegoating and fear. What they really need to hear, more than another guy in a suit telling them they're wrong, is why do we have wage suppression? And it's worth saying here that even where immigration does yield a suppression of wages, the statement that immigrants cause wage suppression is still false. Capitalists cause wage suppression. 
And you can tell they do because they're the ones who pay the wages. And every so often, the government steps in to help them. When Boris Johnson speaks about immigration, he's partially right when he says corporations are doing it. But in 2019, when his Conservative Party dropped the tradition of naming and shaming employers who failed to pay the minimum wage, they were suppressing wages too. And just to put that 1 or 2% stat into perspective, let's look at some of the more substantial methods that are used to suppress wages. And the role immigration plays in this story might surprise you. After the Second World War, British governments made it their role to ensure full employment in the economy. For a time, they did so quite successfully. This meant very few people were unemployed, and businesses that wanted to hire workers had to offer decent wages or risk losing them to a competitor. Companies were the ones competing for workers. The inflation crisis that hit Britain in the 1970s was mostly blamed on the excessive power of trade unions, which had the nation in a vicious cycle of workers demanding higher wages, and companies paying those wages, but then raising prices to counter their losses. When Margaret Thatcher was elected in 1979, a string of policies were introduced to discipline the workforce and grow the reserve army of labour. They passed legislation, now known as the anti-union laws, which made it increasingly difficult for workers to go on strike. In 1981, the Conservative Chancellor Geoffrey Howe took part in possibly the most sinister act of wage suppression when he pushed a budget which was deliberately designed to increase unemployment, thereby reducing the bargaining power of workers. But the role immigration played in all of this wasn't quite what you'd expect. When Marx and Engels were writing about the Reserve Army of Labour, their research was limited to Irish immigrants in the UK. Marx saw immigration purely as a tool that capitalists would use to lower the wages of native populations in rich countries. The problem here is, Karl Marx can't explain everything. Times have changed quite a bit, and capitalists now have access to billions of workers around the world many of whom are willing to work for less than $2 a day. The real tool for wage suppression in the modern world is the global reserve army of labour. When bosses want to cut back on wages, they don't do it by bringing workers over here. They do it by moving the work over there. During Thatcher's government, the production sector plummeted as major industries moved their work to the low-wage haven of Southeast Asia. Unemployment soared and the high-skilled jobs in the manufacturing industry were replaced by low-skilled service jobs that dominate the country's economy today. Real wages in the UK have either been declining or stagnant ever since, and the policy of Labour and Conservative governments alike has been don't give them an inch or else they'll take a mile. Give into the jungle gym today and they'll want better food tomorrow. Soon they'll demand a longer recess and then more free reading time. Eventually rock and roll will take over the world. Society will crumble and Western civilization as we know it will come to an end. But if we look at the timeline here, there's a gap. Wage suppression started taking off in the UK in the mid-70s. Net migration didn't start blowing up until 20 years later in the mid-90s. Around the same time, you might have noticed, as a slight increase in real wages. What? That's because the role of immigration is not the same as it was in 1845. Today, immigration is used to stop businesses from moving offshore. And because industries that depend on immigration tend not to employ only immigrants, the role of immigration in keeping these businesses at home also keeps jobs for native workers at home. A study on the immigrant population in Denmark showed that firms in areas with higher immigration were less likely to move their businesses offshore. They give a specific example of the Danish pork industry, which moved most of its production offshore after showing a reluctance to hire immigrant workers. Their German competitors, who were willing to hire immigrants, have succeeded in keeping most of their production local. In the modern world, immigration is a response to wage depression, not the other way around. And in case you're wondering why these jobs can't all be done by locals, it turns out that migrants and locals have different skill sets. And the jobs migrants take end up complementing other jobs that are taken by locals. A case example of this would be in the strawberry fields in Britain, which famously depend on immigrant labour, but have been suffering shortages since the reduction of immigration following the Brexit referendum. As you might have expected, the locals are either unwilling or unable to fill the jobs. So I'm just getting to the end of this now, and I should probably mention that this whole idea of subjecting other human beings to a cost-benefit analysis before deciding whether or not they're allowed to be here is actually kind of shit. 
Wait, why did I make this video again? I guess a lot of us argue on these terms because it feels like we're forced to. But I want to argue that the way we should address immigration should actually be the same even if it is causing wage suppression. In the 1970s, over three quarters of British workers were members of a trade union, compared to less than one quarter today. The subsequent failure of the British labour movement to integrate immigrant workers in the past has given employers free reign to pay out whatever wages they please. By splitting workers up into this false conflict between immigrants and natives, we stand no chance of fighting against things like offshoring, or underemployment, or automation. These are things that workers can only handle together. If you'd rather not spend the coming decades struggling to make ends meet in a job that hangs by a thread while your boss secretly builds a robot version of you, you need to start realizing that you and your immigrant neighbors have a common enemy here, and that enemy is capitalism. Immigrant workers are your allies, and unless you treat them as such, the conditions of all working class people will be stuck in an endless race to the bottom with no winners at the end. And this is where my sympathy for people with anti-immigration sentiment ends. Because if you know about this, but still insist on denying immigration because of wages, then maybe you're just being kind of racist. There. Said it. Well, uh, look at this. I have names to read out at the end of my video. Uh, I honestly didn't think I'd ever be doing that, so... A massive thanks to Arwen Du, Benjamin S, Jangle Science Lad, Carl Tal, Andreas, Andy Haywood, Daniel Katzenelson, Mithaldu, Nicholas Carr, Seek Noise, Icarus, and Scythe. I am insanely grateful to all of you. I suppose I should also thank El Cincinnatus for the amount of mad shit that they've posted in my comment sections. Um, your perseverance is second to none. <laughs>